So, uh, loving our enemies. Love, love your enemies. That'd make a good, good yard sign, wouldn't it? Love your enemies. Um, however, I haven't seen that yard sign very often. I have seen this yard sign a lot, um, in, in especially last year. Uh, probably a number of you saw this yard sign, which had a very pretty clear double entendre that was typically in the front yards of, of those people that weren't necessarily voting for uh, Donald Trump. The, the, the immediate meeting is, is that love is, is more powerful than uh, hate. Um, then, of course, there was the understanding that, that if I am more progressive or I'm a Democrat, uh, my party is more loving and it trumps the hate that we're seeing in the other party. It's um, kind of an interesting message there. But I think there's more, more meanings uh, to this if you look at it a little bit more closely. Because one of the things that we've recognized as our president, who tends to be not the most PC president we've ever had, says things that some people only think out loud. And some of those things can be a little bit abrasive. You know, things about Mexican rapists or, or, or about the, the Muslim religion being kind of antithesis to American values or locker room talk about women or uh, things about the mainstream media or whatever it is. When, when he said certain things like that that can sound abrasive, there are some people that I think in America who actually love Trump's hate. Kind of, it's fun to have someone who will say those things that other people won't say out loud. Say the things that I might just think and I kind of love it. There's a lot of people in our country for a lot of years who have felt hurt or left out or overlooked or neglected. And if we can have a, a group of people or an individual or mainstream media or the government or the liberals or whoever it is and we can hate them, that feels kind of cathartic. It's kind of nice to get it out in that, in that way. And then I think that the fourth way to read this yard sign is that I have noticed that a lot of people who purport to be kind of open-minded, loving progressives, I have found that as they have talked about our president, I think more they actually love uh, to hate Trump. So that the common denominator through all of this is that we kind of all love to have somebody to hate. Whether we would say that out loud or not, it helps to have something, someone, something upon which we can project our frustrations, what we think is wrong with the world. Love, and the kind of love we're going to be talking about in this Lenten season, which in, in the Greek is the, the word agape, which is a, an others-focused love, is not an easy thing. It's something that takes a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of effort. And the fact of the matter is, it's a lot easier and it's a lot quicker to have the reaction to blame or to get angry at or to even hate people that raise our ire, that, that bring up something within us that causes us angst or frustration. It's a lot easier to hate and to be angry than it is to feed and to nurture and to grow and our ability to selflessly love others, especially those that we don't like. But here's the rub. Just to clarify here, there, there's a, a handful of us in the room who would say that we are Christians. Would you raise your hand if you would say you're a Christian? Would you raise your hand if you say you at least try to be a Christian? Try, keep your hands up. Try to follow the teachings of Christ. That, that, that's kind of one of the main goals in your life, in fact, is to try to be that kind of a person. Okay, thank you. The rub is this. Those of us who just raised our hands, kind of the, the, the primary defining factor of what it means to be someone who follows Christ, wants to be a Christian, is that we don't have to enjoy whoever is in the White House. We don't have to agree with whoever is in the governor's ma mansion. We don't necessarily even have to like our neighbor, but what do we have to do? We have to love them. We have to love. That's, that's like the base level. That's the foundation of what it means. If we say we are Christians, if we say we are people that want to follow Christ and be like Christ, then we better be people who love. 
And when other people look at our lives and how we talk and how we act and how we think about and treat our neighbors and others, they better see within us if there's anything to this claim of ours that looks like love, that smells like love, that sounds like love. Why do we have to start there? (laughs) Why does love have to be the first thing that kind of identifies us as Christians? Well, we got into this last week with our scripture text, and, and, and the reason we love is because God loves you, John. And, and, and God loves you, Catherine, and God loves you, Lydia, and God loves me. And God knows everything about us. Knows everything about our lives, the, the secrets that we keep, the, the beautiful parts of who we are, the broken parts we, we are, the, the, the deep voids that we don't even admit to ourselves. God knows that and God loves you. Every day God wakes up loving you. And when we know and we can receive God's love, what we are supposed to do then in turn is allow that love to transform us, breathe it in, and then breathe out that same agape, forgiving, enduring love onto others. We love because God first loved us. That's kind of Christianity in a nutshell. It's not our Sunday school attendance. It's, It's not our theology. It's not who we vote for. It's not whether we smoke. They'll know that we're Christians, why? Yeah, I love. And if we take this faith of ours seriously, this identity that we claim, then things like kindness and gentleness and acts of selfless service should be increasing in our lives, are they? That's what Lent is about. It's a time to kind of evaluate, get back to basics. What do we believe and and is how we act and how we speak and how we think in line with what we believe and are we growing more in the direction that we want to grow or we kind of moving sideways? How, How are we doing? This is a season for reflection. Thank God for that. And the amazing thing about being a Christian is that it allows us to tap into this miraculous power of God's love that allows us to partake in something that is truly illogical, seemingly contradictory, and without God, pretty much impossible, and that is uh, to love our enemies, those who even seek to do us harm. And yet that's a fundamental key, a part of who we are and what our calling is and and what our scripture is about this morning. We're going to be reading this morning and for the next few weeks on and off from Matthew chapter five. So if you've got a Bible in front of you, I encourage you to grab Matthew. You've got an NRSV or a CEB Bible. Matthew chapter five, starting in verse 38. We're also gonna be looking a lot at, at Luke chapter six. Matthew chapter five is called the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gathered together with those who'd been following him for some while and, and this, uh, this kind of captivating, intriguing, charismatic rabbi all of a sudden uh, started talking a little bit crazy. And the Sermon on the Mount started saying things that after which people, fewer people started following him because of the radical nature of what he was calling them to be and to do as followers of Yahweh. In verse 38 of chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this. He says, you have heard it it, that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, the idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was actually a a gracious and, and, and merciful equation because prior to that in the Older Testament, if someone took your eye, you took their life. Right? And, and, and violence was escalated. You do this to me, I do this to you and your family. Right? And so there's this cycle, cycle of violence that increased. So actually an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was decreasing that cycle of, of, of violence. But Jesus takes it a step further, a, a few steps further in fact. But I say to you, Jesus says, you must not oppose those who want to hurt you. If people slap you on your right cheek, you must turn the left cheek to them as well. They wish to haul you to court and take your shirt. Let them have your coat, too. When they force you to go one mile, go with them, too. Give to those who ask and don't refuse those who wish to borrow from you. 
Now, in subsequent, subsequent weeks, we're, we're going to get into this a little bit more and what that means. I want to just be clear with you right now. We're not talking about a, a passive love. What Christ is advocating here is, is quite strong, and, and there's a resistance to it. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more next week. Verse 43, you, you have heard that it was said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven, who makes the sun to rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors, or which was kind of a, a synonym for you know, people who are corrupt or are in, in league with the enemy, don't even those people do the same? And if you greet, you know, say good day and blessings upon just your brothers and your sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete, the CEB says, which I like that translation. Just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also you must be complete. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. This this kind of Matthew 5, agape, selfless, others-focused love is more than a feeling. It's, it's a verb. It's an action. It's a way of life. It's not weak. It's strong. It's not meek. It's powerful. In fact, the most powerful force for good in the world. MLK, uh, Dr. King, this is one of his favorite verses. He preached from this very often in the way he chose to respond with love, nonviolent love, to those who were aggressors of the black people in the 1950s and 1960s in the United States. And we saw the results of that sort of loving, peaceful nonviolence in his life. We continue to see the struggle there and the, hopefully the inbreaking of, of love in the face of racism in our country. But King talked about how it was interesting in his mind, uh, how the, the, the person whose life characterized the teachings of Christ by the, the, the best Christian of the 20th century said was, was a Hindu named Mahatma Gandhi. Apparently, Gandhi read Matthew 5 every day, started every morning by reading Matthew 5. And as he read that and he thought about what it meant to love and to show love towards those aggressors, Gandhi himself became more powerful than Julius Caesar or any of the many conquering armies that tried to overthrow the British Empire and through his love and peaceful resistance helped to break down the, the stronghold of the British Empire upon the nation of India. Powerful, powerful is this kind of love. And in more modern contexts, we've seen Mairead McGuire, the Northern Ireland woman whose three nieces were actually killed, run over by an IRA terrorist who responded with love, with conversation, and helped the process of beginning to break down that decades-long conflict in Northern Ireland. Lamog Bowie, the Liberian woman who responded to the hate and the violence in her nation by encouraging the women of her nation to dress in white and march in the streets and to show love to the army and the oppressors and ended up bringing peace to that nation. And then, of course, we have Jesus of Nazareth in whose life and teaching and example proved to us that love, true sacrificial agape love, can change families and societies and the world. And so if, if we know that this is a power that is palpable, that is beautiful, that can tear away and tear down the strongholds of hate and violence in our families, in our lives, and in our world, then you would think if there was this kind of power available to us, more of us would make use of it, right? More of us would think, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I should be doing. I should be loving my enemies. But the problem is... Um, is that most of us, when we admit it, when we're honest with ourselves, we actually love to have enemies more than we love our enemies. Enemies are convenient. They're helpful. They can protect us because enemies 
or something that are outside of ourselves, something that we can concentrate our righteous indignation upon. That's the problem with the world. That's the problem with my life. That's the problem with society. So we actually love having enemies. And if we can admit that, that is the first step in our process of, of, of learning how to actually love our enemies. Right? All of us have got a, a villain. You know, whether it's that liberal or it's that elite, whether it's that corrupt congressperson, that vice president, that Muslim, that redneck, that righteous, hypocritical Christian, right? Somewhere, somehow, each one of us find a group or a people or a thing upon which we can kind of focus our frustrations, our anger. We all like to have a good villain, a good enemy in our lives. Philosopher Peter Collins has... um, informed a lot of my thought on, on this and, and what I'm going to say about this idea of loving to have enemies rather than loving our enemies. And he, and he puts it in kind of a provocative question. He asks this. He says, do we love our enemies like a hypochondriac loves their disease? Do we love our enemies like a hypochondriac loves their disease? Now, a hypochondriac right, a person who thinks that they are ill or sick all the time, might indeed get a diagnosis that they have skin cancer. And they really do have skin cancer. But they're still a hypochondriac. The fact that they've got a skin cancer to focus on, they've got a a, a basal cell carcinoma that, that, that is right here that they can focus on doesn't take away the fact that they are still a hypochondriac. Hypochondria is a manifestation of a deeper illness, a deeper struggle, a deeper brokenness within that person, whether it's deep sadness or it's a fundamental feeling of, of, of loneliness and neglect or depression or anxiety, whatever it is, that's the deeper issue. And the, and the hypochondria is the manifestation of that. And so when I find out that there is indeed skin cancer on my hand, then, then that actually becomes a support, a bolsterer of the very thing that is keeping me from dealing with the deeper wound. Does that make sense? Do we love our enemies the same way a hypochondriac loves their disease? Our skin cancer, our enemy, can become the thing that we concentrate our energy upon, right? It's kind of like, don't, don't look at the man behind the curtain. Just keep looking over here, right? The, we want to deal with the fact that I drink too much or, or I work too much. I'm a workaholic or, or whatever it is. We want to focus everything there, and we should because that is a problem. But if you don't deal with the underlying reason, the underlying emptiness, the brokenness, the void, the pain that is causing me to self-medicate, then all we're going to do is play a series of whack-a-mole, right? And we get rid of that thing, and then something else comes up. And until we recognize that we actually love having symptoms, we, lo- we love having enemies, then we're not going to be able to take real strides into learning what it means to actually love, agape, love uh, our enemies. Our illnesses, our anger, our enemies can actually protect us. But the thing is, our, our enemies, our, our, our symptoms, our illnesses, our addictions can also be our salvation. And what I mean by this is, is that, um, as Colin says in, in, in French, the word Symptom is an archaic language, an archaic form of the word symptom is santom. Santom. Symptom. He said, but santom is also a, a, a complex word. It's a joining together of holy man. And so that our symptoms can actually be holy people. They can actually be prophets. That if we look at our symptoms, if we look at what it is that we keep out here, whether it's our enemy or it's our... Or it's our symptom, our disease, if we can look at that a little bit more deeply, it actually might point its way to something, to the deeper thing, to the deeper pain, to the hurt, that the need that's going on in my life, in my family, in my society. And in that way, it can actually be a a, a blessing to me if I take the time to kind of follow it back, to trace the trail that it leaves. And so if we're honest... 
our symptom might actually speak words that we ourselves don't have the courage to speak. Why, why do I hate those people so much? Why do I hate that thing so much? Why do I hate that guy so much? Well, it might because, be because if I trace that back a little bit and I do some deeper work, it might be because, actually, I hate my job. I hate my living situation. My marriage is falling apart. I hate my life. Right, but who, who has the guts to make that kind of a naked and vulnerable confession? That's a difficult thing to say out loud to yourself or somebody else, but I gotta tell you folks, the, the secret is each one of us at one level or another has that level of brokenness or pain or void within us. But if I can't speak that out loud, what I can do is I can project it on somebody else. I can love, love to have an enemy. I can remember when I was a, a little guy and uh, I, was, I was kind of a sensitive, I know it's hard to believe, kind of a sensitive little guy uh, when I was four or five years old. And I remember being in my bed at night and crying and not really knowing why I was crying and my dad or my mom come and try to comfort me and they'd read to me. And, um, and then uh, the same thing happened with my three kids, my three kids, right when they got to about four years old, somewhere in there. And it's basically at that age where developmentally their little psyches, their little minds, their little hearts get to the point where they start to understand the world and the size of the world a little bit bigger than their own, right, their own narcissistic bubble that they're supposed to live in when they're, when they're just little ones, right? And, and all of a sudden they're lying there at night and they're starting to think and they're thinking about themselves and their families and all of a sudden somewhere around that age that little beautiful little brain and soul starts to realize, oh my gosh, just like great-grandma or great-grandpa or whoever, mom is going to die. And dad is going to die. And I'm going to die. And all of a sudden, that catastrophic monstrosity of a painful thought overwhelms these little four or five-year-old brains and hearts and souls, and they begin to cry, and literally their hearts break. And so what psychologists say, what we do at that age, this starts very young, folks, this thing that we do. What they do at that age is rather than deal with that monstrosity of that reality of their own mortality and the mortality of those that they love, the gods in their life, what we do is we split that thing off and we cast that monstrosity away and it becomes the monster under the bed. And so there's a monster under my bed so that that monster doesn't have to be in my head and in my heart. And as we continue on in our lives, that monster all of a sudden becomes the person in the White House. Or that monster becomes the person in the governor's office. Or that monster becomes those people across the border. Or that monster becomes that neighbor. Or the monster becomes my name, you know, fill in the blank. We have a hard time loving our enemies because honestly, we, we love to have enemies because they protect us. They keep us from having to deal with the monstrosity, the fears, the doubts, the brokenness within our own lives, within our own souls. There are, of course, dangerous and um, broken and dishonest people in the world that do bad things, horrible things. But friends, we are the ones who create monsters. And if we convince another enough other people that that person or those people are monsters, then together perhaps we can destroy them and our world can be great again, can be safe again, can be whatever it is. You see how that works? If we just deal with that monstrosity, if we just deal with that problem, if I could just everyone get everyone to agree with me that, that, that that's it, that's, that's the issue. When we admit that we actually at some level love having enemies and we'd rather focus on the symptoms, then we can begin that deep, difficult, vulnerable, scary work of sorting through the sadnesses and the voids in our own lives and our own families. And there we are, 
back to square one where Christianity starts. God loves you. God knows you, God loves you, and God meets you in the very void, the very brokenness where you think you can't be loved or known. So the first enemy that we have to love is ourselves, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When we allow ourselves to admit and acknowledge the deep brokenness and sadness and fears that reside in each one of us, then we also allow ourselves and open ourselves up to letting God meet us and love us there. And and if we can do that on on a regular and, and daily basis as we are supposed to do in this faith of ours, then when we see that angry angry or, or weird or twisted or desperate act in another, we will begin to see not monsters to hate, but echoes of deeper pains in our own lives. There was this uh, miraculous exchange that took place not that long ago on Twitter that kind of spelled this out for me, showed me in real life that this actually works. Anybody um, here know Sarah Silverman? Sarah Silverman is a, a female uh, Comedian, she's funny as heck. She's got an acerbic wit uh, and not the cleanest um, language. And so be careful if you look up a video of her stand up after your pastor told you about her. Um, <laughs> very funny, very smart woman, but very strong. And again, um, uh, pretty, pretty pointed in her, her judgments and her, in her um, commentary on society. Silverman has also got a very large uh, Twitter following. And, uh, and not that long ago, just a few weeks ago, uh, there was a gentleman who followed her that began to post um, just absolutely horrible and sexist comments about her, just degrading, awful things that you, you wouldn't want to repeat, um, kind of out of nowhere about Sarah. And, and I think those who followed her and saw this were kind of waiting for her to come back and just, just level this troll, you know, just tear him a new one and, and, and use that acerbic wit of hers and, and crush him. But it was interesting what she did. She basically responded in a tweet to this gentleman who had just called her very awful things in front of all of her Twitter followers. Silverman said, hey, um, I see you. I see, I see you. And I see what you're doing. I've taken a moment and I've looked back over your profile and I think the awful things that you are saying to me are are actually just thinly veiled pain. And I want you to know that I've I've been through some pretty painful things in my own life and, and I'm sorry for what you've been through, but let me encourage you to try love and not hate. What an amazing response. Can you imagine if we tried that on? the next time someone's rude or or nasty to us. And then this guy, this Twitter troll, this jerk, responded to her and said, "I, I would love to try love, but I can't because some man stole that from me when I was just a boy. And he kind of shared about some horrible experiences he had been through and in his life and, and this, you can, look, you can look this up, their kind of Twitter response goes back and forth and uh, he ends up revealing to her that, that he, on top of the emotional pain and deep wounds in his life, also had this chronic back pain that kept him really from even getting outside of his house and he was in constant pain. And, and, uh, and what Silverman ended up doing as a, as a result of this Twitter back and forth is she started a GoFundMe page and thousands of her followers ended up funding uh, the surgery that this gentleman, that this troll, that this jerk needed on his painful back. And he was able to get the surgery and then respond back in thankfulness to everybody who had seen past his nastiness. And it helped not only to heal his chronic pain in his back, but also the chronic loneliness and brokenness in his life. It works. It really does, but it it takes us first looking past our need to meet violence with violence, to to meet hatred with hatred, to to recognize the fact that we actually enjoy having enemies and symptoms and people to hate. Those things that, that we allow to be so, to do so in our lives, 
point us back to the deeper issues. And if we allow God to love us there, allow others to know us and love us there, then when we are tempted to hate the enemy, perhaps we can begin to choose instead to just wonder about them. I wonder what's going on in their life. I wonder why they are the way they are. I wonder what makes them say those things. And when we begin to wonder about somebody else, we begin to become more curious about them rather than more angry at them. Because as good as it might feel in the instant to hate or to sustain anger towards our enemies, we, as we all know, are actually the ones who are crippled the most by such choices, right? We can all take a step in this reflective Lenten season towards learning what it means to truly love our enemies by wrestling with our own tendency to love having enemies. As we reflect this morning, I, I would encourage you to just think about what enemy do you find yourself obsessed with today? What enemy, what symptom do you find yourself obsessing with and turning to with your anger, your righteous indignation, whatever it is? And, could perhaps that be a, a holy man, a prophet that can lead you back to a deeper issue, a deeper need, a deeper pain in your life where God wants to love you this Lenten season?